Hey everyone, this is Kyle from Notional Finance, and you're listening to the Notable Builders Podcast. There are more DeFi projects than ever to keep up with, so we're going behind the scenes to chat with the real builders, the people driving innovation, bringing in new users, and creating real value for the entire ecosystem. Today we're talking to Dimitri and Teo from Mstable. Mstable is a decentralized stablecoin ecosystem that aims to solve the significant fragmentation problem in same paid crypto assets. We discuss how their meta assets are being integrated throughout DeFi and the challenges of bootstrapping a new way of thinking about stablecoins. Enjoy. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so today we're here with uh, Notional CEO Teddy, and we are talking with the Mstable team today. So uh, why don't you guys go ahead and give a little intro about yourselves and how you made your way into the crypto scene and Mstable specifically? All right. I'm Theo. I'm a head of growth at Mstable. I think I joined last summer. So around um, July, August 2021, before crypto, I was doing venture capital. And my background is originally in finance and like I've done like financial engineering studies. So because I was investing into really Web2 things and uh, I thought, you know, the marketplace model is not the end game of technology and like the future in general. And I had like a very good friend of mine who was doing nothing but talk about crypto. And as I was speaking with him and as I was digging into what's Bitcoin, what's, what's this kind of decentralized technology, what's peer-to-peer -peer cryptography and stuff like that, I literally decided to quit my job and like try to find a job in there. And uh, went to crypto, I think, yeah, cryptojob.com, applied to everything, met a few founders and eventually uh, got the, the opportunity to work at Mstable. Cool. Cool. Uh, maybe, Teo, I guess while we're waiting for Dimitri... What is Mstable and what's the vision for you guys? Um, so Mstable is a stablecoin ecosystem. Originally, it's an AMM, a bit like Curve, but with a, a native um, asset, which is a stablecoin, which is called MUSD. MUSD is a meta stablecoin, so it's a basket composed of four stables, being USDC, uh, SUSD, USDT, and um, a last one, which I, I always forget. So basically, we created this AMM ecosystem with a native stablecoin, and we give utility to this stablecoin through a product called Save. Save is a way, is a place where you can park your MUSD and then generate an API on this MUSD. How do we generate this API? We lend automatically the underlying you use to mint MUSD on AV and Compound. And actually, I think this is the very part where Mstable and Notional could collaborate because as we use those lending primitives to generate yield, uh, we could uh, somehow generate a higher yield using a national. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that there's lots of opportunity. And, and you know, before, I, I don't want to kind of get ahead of ourselves, but I definitely want to make a note to ask you guys to talk about, you know, what's coming next in, in Mstable V2. And and I think we, we can talk about that a little bit later. But, but yeah, I think that there's a, a lot of opportunity for Notional and Mstable to collaborate for sure. Uh, maybe now Dimitri is a... Uh... Dimitri can be live. We'd love Dimitri to introduce himself and maybe go into this direction of the vision. And uh, maybe we can talk about V2 yeah, later on. Yeah. Thanks, guys, for inviting us. I had slight issues with uh, Twitter Spaces. I really hope at some point it's going to be a really nice application and it's going to work flawlessly. But yeah, I'm Dimsum, Dimitri, um, product manager at Mstable. And I joined Mstable one year ago, coming from the community. I was first just uh, engaging with the community, trying to uh, write proposals, uh, started a part-time job there, and yeah, now full-time on board, product manager, and part of the V2 vision in a sense. So just to go deeper into what we are actually looking into further, we started out with MUSD in order to abstract away the complexities about the fragmentation of stable coins, because there were just so many stable coins. Now it's even worse. Now there's like even more stable coins. But what we realized soon is that our MUSD stable coin was mostly used in other pools to generate a yield. So nowadays, the majority of users, when they mint MUSD, they either deposit it into SAFE, which earns a really competitive yield, or they deposit it into the MUSD three curve pool. So MUSD as the asset is really only useful in those two avenues. So we realized that the asset is 
well, it has some utility, but the majority of the users seek actually the yield. So that's where we're kind of heading with our next iteration of the product as well. We are leaning further into the safe concept, wanting really to give users the ability to have easy access to yield. That's pretty much what I can say at this stage. And one thing that we're also really looking at is ERC-4626. That's the yield-bearing token standard. And that allows pretty much to standardize how yield-bearing tokens function on the Ethereum ecosystem. So once everybody adopts it, we feel that's a really net positive for the whole market. And it's going to allow for a lot more composability. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So maybe we should go back just a tiny bit and um, talk a little bit about like what the problem that Mstable is really solving and and how it really works on the back end, just as a kind of brief overview. So I might start with that and, and Dimitri will follow up. So as Dimitri just said, we wanted to solve the fragmentation of stable coins because first thing I think people need to understand is like Mstable was born in DeFi summer, early DeFi summer 2019, where there was only like four or five stables. And we thought about creating a basket of those four or five stables to abstract the complexity and uh, add this AMM, which enables you to migrate and flexibly like swap from one asset to another and, and using MUSD as this kind of you know, bridge assets. How it works in the back end, as I said, you have an AMM, you can mint MUSD with those four stables, but you can then redeem MUSD against any of the four stables. So it's like you go win one asset and you can actually get four. So what you solve with that is the fragmentation and the access to different stable cards. You might say, why would you solve the fragmentation by adding a new stable card? So that's maybe the reversed or the opposite side of the question. But we, we thought that even though we add an asset, we actually provide some extra liquidity and a very easy way to migrate between one asset to another. So that's, that's kind of the trade-off. Is this clear about how like MUSD and like the genesis of that, or do you need any more specific and explanations? Yeah, I mean, I think that's clear to me. I, I just wanted to jump in. You know, I think I, I'm just curious. Obviously, there's, you know, just been an explosion in stable coins generally. I think that you know, lots of people talk about it as like, it's one of the primary things in DeFi that's really worked and has achieved product market fit. And I'm curious as a team that is focused on a stable coin and stable coins, where do you see the space going forward? Do you think in the next two years, are there going to be more stable coins or is there going to be some kind of consolidation? Mm, very tough question. Pretty hard to predict what the future will bring, but we can see now like a real explosion of stable coins. And that's quite interesting to observe, actually. Um, there are many different designs and many different approaches. What I personally think is that at some point the market of it will consolidate. So, of course, I don't think there will be in the future, in the next two to three, four years, uh, a bunch of stable coins. I think it's going to get concentrated to a few winners. And I don't really know what the best winner will be because at some point, like on the one hand, we have backed stable coins like USDC, USDT. They have a lot of adoption, but they have also inherently flaws. But then we also have this totally new cohort of stable coins launching that is fractionalized algorithmic stable coins like FRAX, USDT, and that design also gets start to be copied a lot. Like we, we see that USN is also launching soon, I think. And that's the interesting fact because when something gets good adoption, it will get copied, right? But at some point it will all go back to the few winners that will probably remain and dominate the market. And at some point, this problem will be solved, I think, as well. The next problem will then be probably what to do with those stable coins that remain. What is their utility in the market? And I think that's a bigger question as well. Would you agree, Theo? I agree with the, it's very hard to time the market. And I really see stables are blockchains or layer ones. It's like um, you have a, a blockchain which is very attractive, which is working on a specific consensus. And then there's another one with a new consensus which is emerging with a lot of attraction and exemption. And then kind of like slows down in growth. And then the main one, which was the first one, is actually changing a bit its design. 
like Terra, for instance, Terra was supposed to be, I would say, stablecoin and algorithmic stablecoin, but now it's adding hard assets to its reserve. So it's becoming something less of an algorithmic stablecoin, but more of a USDC or USDT kind of backed uh, by, by something. So I feel like it's going to evolve in a very hybrid way where deep liquidity is going to be the key things. Like if you want to succeed with stablecoin, you need a huge amount of liquidity. And that's why actually MUSD, for instance, is not like as good as it should be just because it's not liquid enough. So I would say hard to say very hybrid stuff going on. Right. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, no, I think um, I think it's a good... Well, so I'm not sure. I mean, it, it seems like the number of stable coins continues to increase. I guess what I would say is like, maybe there's different kinds of stable coins. So, because I don't think that all stable coins necessarily need to be means of payments. So, you know, something like USDC or USDT or FRAX or you know, perhaps you want M- MUSD to be this as well. It seems to me these stable coins are trying to be sort of like something that you would pay people with. But I don't think that that's necessarily the only thing that a stable coin can be. It can also just be like a representation of debt. It's sort of like commercial paper. It's like a representation of the debt of a protocol. So it can be sort of like unique to that protocol. It's not necessarily used for payments. It's more just like a, a representation of like a debt that the protocol owes. I think that's like that's like different. And I could see there being a lot of those. And I don't know if you even necessarily call them stable coins. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Yeah. As a unit of accounts, that's that's what you're meaning. Rather than having this as the kind of store of value for people to exchange and pay, but more of a I don't know, you acknowledge the debts or I would say lending positions or specific accounting stuff with these stables. Um, is, is this what you mean? Well, what I mean is like, like let's say you're a protocol and you want to like issue uncollateralized debt, right? Like you want people to give you money and, uh, and, and like you want some representation of what you owe them. You know, a stable coin can be that. You know, like your native stable coin, if I just mint you one you know, notional, well, we don't do this, right? But like, I don't know, like a notional stable coin. And I say, and like, I require you to give me one USDC for it or something. And I say, this is worth one USDC. It's like uncollateralized notional debt. You know, like that's what that stable coin is. And it's like, I'm saying that it's worth one USDC. Um, but like what it is, is just like a representation of like debt that I want to take out. So I don't know if you call that a stable coin necessarily, but I think to some extent, like maybe that's like people are starting to try and do that. I don't know if that makes that makes much sense. I think it does. That's an interesting concept, but wouldn't that mean that like the fragmentation would increase even more so? Because I would imagine that the ones that you issue from your debt is not the same as like another protocol issues. And that will just create a bunch of new assets that are kind of similar, but not really the same. No, that, that's exactly what I'm saying. Like in the, in the same way that like big companies, they issue like, um, you know, very short term debt. It's like almost dollars, but it's not. Then the difference is that like you're taking the risk that the issuing company or the issuing protocol in this case is going to pay you back. But it's like, so you wouldn't use it as a payment, but it's like close to just being a dollar. Interesting. Tokenizing bonds, pretty much. Company bonds. Yeah. I know. I'm just going to just keep, keep talking about it. Like in sort of that direction, I'm sure like one of the issues with this sort of plan would be trust. And, and I guess you guys have been around for several years now, as you mentioned. So how, how have you seen sort of... Um, the challenges, I guess, with, you know, gaining trust over time and really and bootstrapping and stable to the level of adoption that you've had today? I imagine the, the way we, we've done that is like we try to take the four more liquid assets on the market when we started and to have some kind of rules in the AMM. And I think that, that was one of the, our key differences from Curve is to have like mix, uh, like minimum and maximum weights into the baskets so that you, you cannot completely break the peg. Uh, I think the first thing 
about Unstable is like it's not pegged to the dollar, but it's one-to-one -one backed. So this kind of uh, embedded feature just gives you the ability to redeem one-to-one -one MUSD against anything almost immediately. So you don't, you're not really pegged to something which is a huge risk in like a lot of stables. Because in a way, we haven't created, you know, a stable. We have we, we created some kind of index. So we, we inherit the resiliency or not of the four underlines. Uh, we have our own smart contract. We have a few things. But I think this, this is the, a very important feature. It's like if we fail, we fail. But if, let's say, USDC fail or USDT fail, half of DeFi is in a very complex uh, situation. Apart from that, I would say more on the MUSD safe side. What the strategy we have to generate yield is pretty basic, but pretty efficient. It's just like put some money on Aave and Compound and liquidate the rewards and auto compound that. But there is no leverage. There is no, you know, there is no extra layer of risk in the strategy we deploy with say. Sorry about that. I imagine, yeah, the, first the, the, the architecture and the design of the coin and other just the strategy we use is quite, I would say, like non degen in a way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So I think it is interesting. It's kind of an index. So you've kind of spread the risk out between all of the assets that are pegging, I guess, behind MUSD. But so, and one of the things you hear critics of crypto always talk about is like, what happens if Tether fails? What do you think would happen if one of these, you know, main currencies were to have a depeg event? I can really start quickly and Jimmy should my follow up, but you have two options. Either you just uh, separate this four basket thing becomes a three basket thing. So you just compensate whatever was in a UST in like the three others, or you just do a governance cycle and you like just add a few assets to the basket. So you can, you could use like, um, I would say more exotic stables like Faye or Rai, or you can, you could just modify the baskets in any way, which could be either reduce the number of assets or increase it. Dimitri, what do you think? Yeah, let's take the scenario and imagine one of those stable coins fail, right? I think that's very, very unlikely at this point because they have been around for such a long time. Even with the Terrafat, it has been around for so long. But I mean, there is a non-zero chance that could happen, right? Um, first of all, I think a lot in DeFi would break and that will be really test of time about how resilient actually DeFi is uh, to these kind of events, right? And Specifically, what happens then to MUSD is also a very interesting question because, as Theo said, we have min and max weights. So at any point, if one stablecoin becomes too big of the basket, all transactions will fail. So pretty much you cannot redeem more of that, of the other assets, if one already is, uh, or if one is above, I think currently 65%. But there's also a big trade-off we can adjust those min and max weights of each individual asset. So at this point, we have four assets. So they are around 25% each. We can lower that. We can say we only want the max weight to be 30%. But there's a big trade-off with uh, something like the A coefficient. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but it allows pretty much swaps with less slippage by allowing the basket to be more uneven. That's pretty much what Curve does, and that's why Curve can offer huge swaps with minimal slippage, right? So there's a trade-off. We can adjust both values, and if we increase the A value, then we also risk that the basket can get more unbalanced, right? But if we choose a lower A value, then we can actually reduce even the max weights and make a little bit more secure basket as well. So in the event, um, there's a max value at which the asset will only represent a certain uh, amount, but the rest will be still backed by the healthy assets as well. So I think there's kind of a broader question. I'm, I'm interested to hear your guys' views on this because there's no objectively right answers as far as I can tell. And, and the question is just, you know, given that there's sort of a lot of new stable coins and, and they're, you know, and, you know, maybe they're going to be a lot more, who knows? How do you decide which stable coins you are willing to put in your basket? Right. And I think what you see generally, right, is that the big stable coins, the ones that are safest, have like the lowest rates of return. And stuff that is a little newer, you know, like a Fay or a Frax, has relatively higher rates of return. Like basically just what is your decision making process? 
regarding adding new stablecoin assets into your basket? Or are you just not going to do that at all? Well, that's a super interesting question because that was a little bit of a dilemma that we had as well. When we created the first iteration of MUSD, it was with TUSD, as far as I know, and there was no SUSD. But the market changed, and at some point we um, yeah, upgraded the contracts. Like We created a newer version of our M assets contract, and we readjusted the assets. So now it's the four assets that we mentioned before. And that was one point where we actually had the chance to adjust it. At this stage, it would be interesting to do that maybe again, but we are not very sure that this is the direction we should be perceiving. Because if you think about it, there's like so many of these assets. And in order to fairly represent the market with a M asset, the basket needs to be adjusted quite frequently. Because I don't think the market is that static anymore as it used to be. The market uh, used to be very static with those established stable coins. But now it's changing so much that the basket itself needs to be very fluid. And that will inherently create more risk with the basket as well. right? So we really wanted to make sure that our MUSD is the safest option there is. And if you put that in safe, that's the safest returns, uh, savings account in DeFi that you can have. And we still want it to remain that way because MUSD and SAFE is just integrated in many protocols that we don't want to adjust it at this point. Is that a fair assessment, Theo? I, I, I very much agree with that. I was trying to think, and it, it goes back to the question that you first asked, was like, what's the point of the stablecoin? If MUSD is used today to be put either into SAFE or into the curve pool, and people get healed with that, and it's not really used as a way to pay people or to uh, be actually used as a unit of account. So if you want your stablecoin to be used as a, as a way to get some yield, you might want to integrate in the basket some very spicy assets like MIM or like whatever, whatever you know, the new stablecoin that has this kind of insane APY. So I would say that's one way of taking that. And I would say the community would really like that because crypto community are very... DGEN and like they, they want they want to have some you know cool assets to talk about. If you talk, you put yourself in the other position, let's say in the central bank or in the very very risk averse um, players, they would see oh I want a stablecoin that's been around for five years with at least ten billion liquidity and uh, and that's I don't know like th- that doesn't change the basket at all at, at least every two years. So Lindy would be uh, you know the key uh, metric they will follow. So I imagine the two way of saying that is literally what's the purpose of your stable? If it's yield, uh, you need to have some kind of very fast colonage process to add in and add out stables. But if it's yeah, this kind of US dollar reserve assets a framework, um, you want the process to be very hard and you want the, the basket to not change at all. Right. Question for me quickly. Interesting point is that they are, like if the point of your asset of your stable is yield. Do you really need a stable in this case? That's the million dollar question. What do you think, guys? Well, I'm not sure I, I completely understand the question. You know, I, I guess I feel like, well, it's just a matter of your risk preference, right? You know, it's kind of, it's, it's interesting because I feel like for all the talk of how crypto is crazy and irrational, I feel like it actually does a reasonable job, at least from what I've seen in the different stable coins of like, judging risk in the sense that like, you know, if you got USDC and DAI and maybe their sort of risk-free rate is like 2% or something, you know, and, and, you know, quote unquote risk-free. And then you've got Frax and Fay and, and those are more like five or 6%. And that feels like that spread feels fair to me. It, it's just a matter of where you want to fall on the risk spectrum. But like given the increase in risk, I think it's like a fair amount of return compensation that you're getting on these sort of fay and frax. And then and then even with something like MIM, where maybe MIM's up at 10%, you know, that also feels relatively fair. You know, I, I'm not a I'm not a MIM expert, but as I understand it, it's like it's not as risky as people think. And I don't, I think the return reflects that. And you know, again, I'll caveat this in the sense of like saying that I haven't really looked into MIM all that much. But like as I understand it, it's it's like a maker model and it's got, you know, not horrible collateral. It's certainly riskier, but it's like it's a similar model and there's liquidations and, and everything. So 
anyway, as I, I guess what I, what I would just say is that like, you know, it seems to me that it's like, it's about like where you fall on the risk spectrum. And, you know, I, I think that the guys, the path that you guys are taking is, as I understand it, as you're saying here, is that you want to be, you know, on the sort of very safe conservative end of that spectrum. And I totally get that because I think that, you know, maybe today the crypto community is very degen and they want the highest risk and highest reward thing. But you go forward in time, the amount of capital that's looking for risk averse opportunities is so much larger than the amount of capital in the world that's like looking to take a lot of risk. So I, I, I think that the strategy makes sense. So what are the yields uh, for unstable users right now? And I guess we can kind of talk about a little, maybe now is a good time to talk a little bit more about V2 and how the yield structures might change. I'm not sure about the current exact rate of today, but if you look on June and you, you just like do the annual annualized APY, I think over the last year or 16 months, it was around um, 30% over the last year, 16 months. So that's, that's mostly what you get. You might ask yourself, how can we just have 30%, 13%, sorry, uh, on, on stable coins rates? The, the average die rate at that time was around 5 to 6%. So M stable through a kind of interesting design and the automation of the, liqui like the liquidity rewards, the lending rewards you get, um, doubles the die or the uh, USDC traditional savings rate. The way we do that, is because, as we said, MUSD is like an asset on its own. So you have two things that you can do with MUSD. Either you can mint MUSD and put it on, into Curve, or you can mint MUSD and put it into Save. That's the, the two big use cases of MStable. But what happens when you mint MUSD and you put it into Curve, you're not getting the Aave and Compound rewards that we get once we lend that onto Aave and Compound. So if you try to think, how that works is like we pay, we get some yield on Aave and Compound every time someone is minting MUSD. However, Curve and whoever's like bribing Curve is paying for the Curve rewards. So whenever there is like 30 million into save, uh, all the money which is not into save, when she, which is onto Curve, is yielding for these savers. This is the tricky part of Unstable, but this is what makes it like quite compelling and very attractive APY without leverage. So we, we just leverage whichever liquidity is outside safe, but still some MUSD, and we feed that back to the safe pool. So that's how we explain like a 13% uh, rate on APY, like on stables without any kind of, you know, native token rules or like things that would uh, propel the rate. That's a great yield, especially if you're considering yourself safest place to save in DeFi. Yeah, I, I, I feel like I would need another explanation of how MUSD works and, and how you guys are generating that yield. Um, that, that sounded quite complicated to me. I'm sure it works. I just like, I, like me personally, I think I'd need, I'd need to hear that again. Yeah. So basically, it's like, the TVL of MUSD is like, I think, 100 million. So there is 100 million MUSD that got minted uh, with stable clients. The MUSD contract works in a way that whenever you're minting, we're going to automatically deposit the money on our main compound and start generating yield. The interesting thing is like you have some people that are going to have MUSD and put this MUSD into curve, but they won't get the yield from our main compound. And we use this liquidity, which is on our main compound, from the MUSD collateral to give that back to the to the people who are using the MUSD in safe. So ah, have, I see. So you yeah. have you have those people who are like they have MUSD and they're putting this MUSD on curve and they get the curve rewards and the curve yield. But M stable is not involved in that, it's just liquidity on curve. But still, because of the way smart contracts are actually done, you can automatically lend the collateral on our end compound. And the moment you know people want to redeem their MUSD. We stop lending, but we just use the collateral in a way so that it benefits the savers. That's really cool. So why do the MUSD people, why do they put their MUSD on Curve instead of in the in the save product? I'll answer that in a second. Um, I just try to give up-to-date numbers on the actual interest rate. Um, so currently on Aave for the underlying like USDT, USDC, and DAI, it's 2 to 3%, while in stable safe, it's 5.2%. Uh, it used to be historically a bit bigger because well, the market was also 
issues here, a lot of uh, lending was happening. But we can roughly say that our interest is double that of Aave usually. And that's because, as you said, half of it, half of the mid MUSD actually sits in Perth in the MUSD free Perth pool. And why it sits there? Well, because there are some rewards there as well, right? We all know there have been the Perth um, force as well, um, some riding. So you can deposit MUSD into the Perth pool or convex pool and earn also some really good rewards there with the Perth token, with the convex token, and yeah, and even some swap trades. So I think it's just a trade off, right? Which one, which assets you prefer, or what do you think the yield is better for yourself? Right, got it. And are you guys playing the sort of uh, curve wars? Do, do you own any CVX? Yeah, our treasury has some CVX. Um, so we actually both our own gauge as well. But what we also have, we have a sort of like emissions controller. So very similar to the curve gauge. And that emissions controller, that emissions controller also has a dial for our, um, yeah, for bribing as well. So each week, some MTA gets sent to the smart contract, and then we could release it at some point and yeah, incentivize the, the curve pool as well. Got it. Makes sense. So maybe to, to clarify, the, the emission controller is um, MTA, our native governance token. Um, the inflation is distributed weekly on a very decentralized basis. And um, you have contrast, like literally like curve dose, that can be whitelisted in receiving this new um, this new MTA. Uh, people vote, uh, so it's the gauge. So people vote where should the actual emission go and at which pace. And uh, we have what we call, as uh, Jim would say, a dial. So a dial is just like a reception of this MTA. And um, curve and volume and those stuff, you just need to send an asset to bribe um, specific people for a specific pool. And so that we can automate that and, you know, like not, don't think about every week Pack the money, do a governance thing, have the multi sig doing that. We automate in a way uh, these um, the bribe thing. So the bribe is literally, so we're playing the bribe, let's say the bribe game, but in a very uh, decentralized way through the emission controller, which is our own version of the gauges. Okay, okay, got it, got it. That's very interesting. All right. Um, so maybe just moving forward, because I know we we don't have all day. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what the future holds for mstable and um sort of where you're going and and i don't know maybe we can talk a little bit more about how notional and mstable could could work together as well yeah we'd be happy to do that but maybe i, I would love to start with a question and this question is what led us to think about um v2 and and whatever's going to come next was like, have you seen any kind of huge uh, innovation in the yield aggregation? I would say the top layer of yield uh, in the last like year or two years. Like maybe especially Teddy, have you seen like any any true competitor um, of Yearn in the last year, sixteen months? Yeah, and that's a good question. I think Yearn Yearn's kind of had a lock on the space for sure for a while. I guess I saw the. Instadap Light is doing something now, which I, I'm not exact. I'm not entirely sure on, on what that is, but that was only launched like a week or two ago. Um, so, so yeah, I, I I agree. Like, uh, I haven't really seen any any uh, too many competitors to earn for sure. So that that's a bit of like the premise of our thinking. And uh, as we previously discussed, the stablecoin market and the stablecoin war is actually a war, and it's very costly to lead a war and to participate in a war. And if um, Mstable and MUSD has a very, I would say, decent market share with like a few, like 100 million in TVL, uh, we got a lot of traction on SAVE, which I think was about like 22 million in TVL at the end of last year and went nearly like to 40, 45, 50 million into SAVE. So we were thinking people seems to be more attracted in the yield side of things rather than just holding these tables, which in the end ends up just being a yield sources. And we also noticed that Yearn was doing, since Yearn and the Yearn Vaults, on the yield aggregation side of things, and nothing had changed much. And as uh, I think Dimitri hinted in the first place, yield aggregation is a very tough market because you have to do the strategy, but also because it's a very fragmented market where every yield vault is 
designed in a very specific way with specific connectors and resolvers, meaning it's very hard to aggregate, it's very hard to rebalance, it's very hard to do a lot of things with that. And recently, moved forward by Joyce and Tower from Fay, uh, there was this new 4626 standard that enables to have extension of an LST20, meaning you have a token which represents a vault position. And this kind of new tech enabler could change a lot of things in the yield aggregation area. And so a lot of context element plus this kind of technology enabler led us to think maybe yield would be, and yield aggregation especially, would be a very good area to pursue for Unstable. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So I guess... What will your success metrics be for Imstable, I guess, in the long run and, and how you see the usage growing through this product? Well, I think the key focus is definitely with what we are building right now. And it's still a little bit of an open question how it exactly will look like and what are the exact features as well. Um, we are pretty much working with the team um, very closely to finalize that and actually start building and shipping as well. Um, so we're we actually really excited about what we are about um, yeah, to start to build actually with V2 as well. And in regards to metrics, I mean, in general, we just want to create a good product that people will use. I think part of the focus with all the other stable coins was um, to make the stable coin liquid. And that's what they try to do in, with the bribing. They just try to create as much liquidity for that one stablecoin as possible. We see that with Brax, we see that with USDT. Um, but we have to ask ourselves also, is it really solving a problem for a user? Does the user really care if there's uh, a bunch of one token versus the other token? Would they really use one token over the other token just because there's more out there? So we don't think that's a really compelling argument anymore. Um, maybe it was in the beginning when stablecoins was a new concept, but we're really wanting to create a product that's actually useful. Okay, so on, on that, uh, um, and I'll just, just want to ask a question for you. So I guess w with, uh, with sort of the, the stuff you're working on with V2, now when you're talking about executing trading strategies or yield strategies, there's, you know, you, there's decision making that you, that, like you need to, you need to like make decisions, right? So you need to decide what strategies you want to allocate into and, and when you want to switch and, and all that stuff. And I'm curious, so I'm curious on a couple of things. And I don't know how much of this you, you, can, you can talk about at this point. But one thing I'm curious about is, do you anticipate writing the strategies yourself? And uh, the other thing, or, 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 you know, or do you want to like use other, other people's strategies? That's one question. And the other question how do you think about the process of deciding, you know, if you've got like five strategies that you can allocate into, how do you think about the process of deciding where to allocate your capital and at any time and when to switch? So I think there is a bit to, to approach to that. Both are the pros and cons because when you want to create a strategy, you, you're really thinking, oh, my strategy is going to be the best one and I'm going to, like all the liquidity is going to migrate from a vault to another. But this is quite hard and you need a very huge first mover in your vault to attract other people. Because in DeFi, it's, it's, yes, it's, I would say in crypto, but especially in DeFi, there is, a very, there is no new liquidity coming. So it's really literally people who are switching position from one place to another. So you need to have either an extremely strong brand or you need to have an insanely high IPY. So in one way, I think because of 4626 and because of, because of the, way, the way we see the market and we see sub-optimization here and there, we would love to create our own strategy. But in the other way, we're like, there is no place which aggregates properly existing vaults. Like you go on Yearn, you have like 25 USDC vaults. Um, you don't really know how it's working, how it's going. So we are literally in the middle of those two choices where are we going to make a sufficiently compelling offer to create like new capital entry into our vault or shall we like rather properly aggregate existing vaults? Um, so this is, I would say, a very, very tricky question that we not exactly know the answer for, but it goes back to your original question, which was uh, how, what's the call to action? How do people compare vaults? How do people actually inform themselves from making the actual decision. And I think this goes back to trust. How do I trust the data? How do I know that this vault's been around for 
six months and like the historic APY over 30 days was like, you know, 12% and not the daily APY is like 25% because Volt's APY is only expressed in daily uh, metrics today, which is kind of a, a tough thing and very hard to make informed decisions. And how do I go from one Volt and to another Volt? Do I need to like change interface? Do I don't change interface? So all these questions are very, very important in the how do I inform myself about the volts and the underlying before I actually to my decision? So that's I, I I think that's three problems. And I think we want to solve those three. We're not sure that we will be able to do that, but uh, that that's the that's the uh, current ideas. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no, I, I know it's like it's a tough problem. Uh and, and the thing is like at least from my perspective, you know, th- there's no objective solution. Like with, with, with these problems, it's, it's, there's just a lot of judgment involved. You know, just to use the example of yearn, because they, they, they do this, right? They have a vault and they have, and they have multiple strategies in that vault. And then they sort of dynamically allocate between strategies. And so I sort of feel like when you're, when you're putting your money with yearn, you're exposed to the decision making of their management, you know, and the thing is like, I, and I, I suppose what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that it's very difficult. That problem doesn't go away. Like there's no objective way to like allocate between vaults in like the objectively best way that doesn't exist. So there's always like a management layer. And I, I'm just, I'm curious, you know, I was just curious kind of how you guys were thinking about that. Yeah. Cause I feel like that's like in many respects, that's kind of the hardest part about being a, a yield aggregator, um, or at least I, w- I would think, and you know, I don't have experience doing that myself, but I would, I would just think, I would think that that would be like a really hard problem. Yeah, I think totally, it's a hard problem because it's very, it's very hard to say like, oh, th- as I said, that's going to be the best strategy uh, for this and this reason, and every time you're just making a capital allocation into a specific like yield primitive, being lending options or whatever. Um, you're not entirely sure that that's going to work. And that, that's actually why we, we were thinking maybe it's a good idea to check the, the let's say, the top five volts that are actually 95% of the TVL and see what the strategy is there. And we are still like really thinking about is creating a new strategy that supposedly is going to be the best, is the, is the way to win the market, or is it to properly aggregate those like, you know, blue chip, a very clear strategy that we understand and that we can actually um, explain uh, and display to the users. But uh, maybe I have a question for you, which would be, do you think the problem right now is about the quality of the strategy? So when you go on Yearn, you want to be exposed to new things or you just need clarity on what, what's actually happening, what's the management doing? Like, would you say it's on the trust part or it's more on the user, yeah, I would say exposition to sophisticated products? So, you know, I, I, I know some of the young guys and, and, and I think that they're really, you know, high quality people. I will say that if you go on the interface, it's really not clear, like how decisions are being made. And I think, and I, you know, I think most people don't think about that, you know, so most people sort of like, they'll like, look at the vault and they'll see, they'll see that, okay, these are the strategies that the vault will execute, right? They don't necessarily know what strategy all the capital's in or what the capital split is, but they don't think about the problem of deciding how and when to allocate and switch between different strategies. They just don't think about it at all. So they don't realize that, like, in fact, like, you're exposed to the decision-making, to, to, like, the decision-making of the manager, you know, like, and they just don't think about that at all. So I don't know. I mean, to, to, to me, it's like, it's, it's, I think it's an interesting thing. And I, I would like more clarity on, on, I guess, how those kinds of decisions are made. I think that that would be an improvement uh, to that product. Yeah, glad to hear that. Because the, it seems to be a problem, which is obvious for everyone. It's like strategies are, like yield is the kind of backbone of DeFi. Like everyone's here for the yield, but no one's actually, especially on the, on the, on the full side, actually sure and certain about what's happening and what's this middle layer so you call that the manager but like what's the manager is actually doing when and how is it rebalancing could that be like you know a governance like process to actually change the role strategy so there's a lot of question here 
but we really think that there is a, a market fit for yield. And uh, yeah, I'm happy you, you just you just share this kind of uh, observation as well. For sure. Um, definitely look forward to, to your V2 and, and uh, uh, working with you guys more closely, for sure. Well, I think that's a natural point to ask just real quick if anybody in the audience, uh, feel free to request if you've got any questions, I'll get you on stage. Just give it a minute just in case. Uh, if not, um, anything else, guys? Teddy, Teo, Dimitri, really appreciate your time. If not, yeah, it looks like looks like uh, we don't have any questions from the audience. So, yeah, once again, really appreciate you guys coming on, taking the time. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about Instable and Notional working together in the future. And definitely come back and let us know what's going on. And, yeah, thanks again, guys. Thanks a lot. I think we, Katie, we'll uh, have, Jim Zoom and I will have you on, on our own, like, kind of Friday space, so the way we call that, loud Twitter space uh, in in a week or two weeks, am I correct? Let's do it. <laughs> cool. But uh, very excited about like uh, yeah, notional and stable, like collaborating on this V2 stuff because there's a lot of lo lot of similarities and a lot of uh, money Legos, yield Legos uh, incoming. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, all right, cool, guys. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for, for joining. And, and I'll... Uh, Talk to you. Talk to you soon, and and everybody in the audience. We're gonna be doing another one of these pretty soon. So so you know, uh, check out our Twitter for for reminders from Kyle. Cool. Thanks, Thanks. for having us. Bye bye. bye, -bye.